We're excited to announce that our very own podcasting platform, Zencaster, has become a new sponsor to the show. Check out the podcast discount link in our show notes and stay tuned for why we love using Zen for the podcast. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. This is the Serum Archaeology Podcast. It's the show where we pull back the veil of cultural resources management, archaeology, and discuss the issues that everyone is concerned about. Welcome to the podcast. Hello and welcome everybody to the CRM Archaeology Podcast, episode 230 for January 11th, 2022. I'm filling in for the host, Chris Webster, who is gallivanting about the United States as he is all the time, totally exploring, living that van life. I mean, he's doing all that stuff that Instagram was created to do, but I I don't have Instagram, so I don't know if he's on it. But I've also got some of my uh, esteemed colleagues here with me. We've got Heather in California. Hi, everyone. Andrew in California. Hey, guys. Now, Doug, I'm going to guess, is back in Scotland, but he was in the United States last night. No, time. still in the States. Still still Texas. All right. Right on. Actually, I went to go have some uh, barbecue at some California thing called a Texas barbecue house. It is not like, just so you know, it wasn't like Texas. <laughs> Nobody does it like Texas. <laughs> and the worst thing about having the food there is that I have been to Texas. So I knew that it wasn't as good. So uh, I hope you're enjoying that barbecue. Oh man. Yeah. I actually just had a brisket sandwich. So yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh my God. <laughs> it's, it's, what I wanted, I, man, it's what I do. Like when, when I come back to the States, there's certain things like I you just can't get in Scotland. Barbecue is one of them. And uh, yeah, that's, that's basically all I eat. Uh, Doug's food pyramid is like the yeah. base is just brisket. And then there isn't anything over that. It's just brisket well, sauce. Maybe you got ribs. I mean, this, this oh. you got wings, you, you got links. I mean, uh. man, there's, this is a very complex meat pyramid. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. It's not a pyramid. It's more like a, you know, rhizome of, you know, delicious smoked meats with sauces. You're right. You're right. Yeah. I mean, that's no, the reason yeah, why I, nobody messes with Texas, because we don't want to lose our barbecue source. Yes. Amen. I don't know, man. <laughs> I, I feel like if we had some, like, people from other places, because, you know, like, there's Kansas City barbecue, and there's, like, yeah. the Carolinas have their thing. Uh, I'm pretty sure, like, you've probably just, like... Santa Maria. Yeah, you've probably yeah. just yeah. Maria more there. Uh, Bill, on, like, half the states, <laughs> on, like, their superior barbecue. <laughs> Or well, not, I think who you talk to if folks are listening, then I should probably use my I should join with Andrew. We should use our professor status to make a field school of barbecue where we just travel oh. the country you yeah, know, in, so. in, in Chris's RV. Yes. All, all field school students, everybody in his RV. Mm-hmm. They can just drive us from barbecue land yeah. to barbecue land and we'll just yeah. all have the best for six weeks and we'll write a, a short report about it. That sounds great. And whatever we say, it's true. Yeah, well, yeah. The, we have the PhDs, dude. <laughs> Trust me, I'm a doctor. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Trust Doug, he's a doctor. He yeah. knows what he's talking about when it comes to barbecue. <laughs> I play one on podcast, right? I'm a doctor, I play one on podcast. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. You can join the barbecue roundup. So, Chris, <laughs> if you're hearing us, you might want to fuel up because I think he's in Lake Havasu, so he's almost to Heather right now. He could start. He could start this trip right now. Oh, boy. But anyway, we do have a topic. It's not just only barbecue. It's the ongoing thing that everybody in the United States has been paying attention to and thinking about. And it's, uh, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic, which as we're talking here at the beginning of the new year, 2022, all the numbers are are basically (laughs) pulling a, you know, hold my beer moment, like how many people can get it. Like, we're just going to see how fast everyone can get COVID, I guess. And so, you know, I make a joke about the absolute tragedy of the fact that over 800,000 people in the United States have passed away from COVID, which I don't think any of us collectively have taken the time or had the time and space to really process, you know, the, the depth of what this is doing to our country. And the fact that we have tens of millions of people in the United States, and it's growing by thousands a day right now who have actually uh, contracted COVID. And whether, you know, someone is sick in the hospital, whether they're vaccinated, whatever is going on, the impact of that alone on their job, on their family, on everything. I mean, just the simple fact of having to quarantine away from your kids and your partner and stuff for multiple days in your house. I mean, it's actually something that many of us have the luxury to do and millions of us actually don't have the luxury 
to be away from anyone. We don't have a place to quarantine. And so, you know, what's going on right now is is changing our entire society, right? It's changing the outlook that a lot of people have on life and just kind of the mechanics of our society in general, as we have so many people that are getting COVID that are having to stay home from work in a country with no centralized healthcare, no quality sick time, no kind of paid leave system where we can actually be away from our jobs and still retain our uh, our uh, income. And also just we don't have backups for things like who's going to be the backup to the police who are the backup to the police who have gotten COVID, right? Like, what, what are we going to do when, you know, too many of our nurses have all contracted COVID to actually come to work? Who's the backup for that? And then do we have another layer beyond that? I mean, this these are the kind of questions that we're having to face right now in 2022 that oddly enough, when we when we talked about this in the podcast way back in 2020, we didn't see that this was going to be something that we'd have to deal with. And, you know, today uh, we're going to talk about uh, some of the impacts here, you know, two years in, almost two years into this pandemic, how this has impacted archaeology. But one of the things that I wanted to um, uh, start off with is kind of a discussion about conferences, because I'm supposed to leave in a couple of days to go to the SHA conference in Philadelphia. It's always held the first week of January. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a tough decision for me right now because there's a lot of people who are getting COVID in Philadelphia right now. There's a lot of people in the Bay Area. And then just what I was mentioning before, all the spaces in between, the whole infrastructure I rely on to get there, all the TSA checks, all the airlines, pilots, crews, ground crews, you know, all this stuff is all being impacted by folks getting sick. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, I'm still on the fence here with only a couple of hours to go before going on whether I should cancel or not. Because if I go there, I may not even uh, be able to get back in a timely manner because of COVID or, you know, I'm risking myself actually getting it, not necessarily in the planes or the airport or anything else, but just through the entire pathway of traveling so far and then coming so far. Uh, coming back when I could just stay at my house and stay uh, safe and, and have fewer chances to contract it. But this is actually something that we've talked about earlier on episode 207. We did talk about uh, hybrid conferences because uh, or virtual conferences because last year the SHA had to have their conference virtually. And so, you know, it's like, Last year, the Society for Historical Archaeology was forced to go virtual, but they had, you know, months and months to lead up to it. This year, it's all been planned to be in person. And it's not just the SHA. In a few months, the California the Society for California Archaeology is supposed to have their conference in March. The Society for American Archaeology is supposed to have their conference in April. I mean, these conferences are all scheduled. The uh, American Anthropological Association just had a conference in Chicago in November. And all of these things have been impacted by the pandemic. So I guess I'll turn it over to my colleagues here so that we can talk about some of the mechanics behind the conferences and, and maybe uh, get a little bit more information about, you know, why they can't all be virtual or they can't all be hybrid. Yeah. So I'll jump in there with the difficulties of doing hybrid conferences and then sort of the stigma slash concerns about like all digital conferences is probably they're probably holding back a lot of of organizations and the first part is like the technical aspect so you know everyone is probably pretty familiar at this point with streaming and that um you know you could just pull it up, I don't know, a bajillion different apps uh, that allow you to just do live streaming or, you know, basically you can do Zoom or Teams or stuff like that. And that sort of gives an impression that like, yeah, anyone, you know, you could just, it's really easy. It's simple. We just, we could just easily do streaming. And I'm sure, I'll, I'll throw this all to you guys, but I'm pretty sure you guys have all been on Zoom, Teams, I don't know, whatever other streaming meeting service thing that uh, Skype, you know, everything that's been out there. And there's that one person who basically is like either cuts out like every like two seconds or you don't understand what they're saying or they have to turn off their screen because basically the Internet fails for them. And with a conference, while it seems really easy, it's actually the infrastructure you need is actually really difficult to do hybrid because essentially you can't rely on Wi-Fi. It's either from distribution in the building or you'll overload it 
Um, like everyone's at conferences and the Wi-Fi's have been set up in the past to basically be able to handle, yeah, lots of people tweeting, people sending email and stuff. But like most buildings and most venues aren't set up to have, you know, 20, 30, oh, guys, the SAA, is that like a 50 different sessions going at once? I know EAA is oh. like 50 or 60 different sessions going. Um, and you pretty much most venues to do streaming have to do a hard line. So an Ethernet cable into a, uh, a room. And so, you know, and they charged like, so this is pre pandemic, but the prices I used to get quoted, cause like, you know, doing a lot of filming of conferences, we filmed, edited, and then put up later. Um, but people would be like, Oh, can we do live streaming? I'd be like, yeah, we have the infrastructure to do it, but we need to talk to your venue and venues were going to charge me. So a thousand pounds. So I don't know, at the time between, you know, 1300 and $1,500 per line of a hard line to be able to do a uh, ethernet live streaming Wow! because they, you know, they have to basically they have costs and they pass that on to the organization. So if you're looking at a, at a hybrid event for every session, well, like every concurrent session drop on an extra grand, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's hard to say. Maybe some venues have picked this up now and are, are being a lot better about it now that there's like COVID and stuff. But that's that's the economics right there is they're going to charge you. And, and that was actually like, and sometimes it's like per day. So like to get a line to be able to have a camera. And then, you know, this is assuming like the venue, That's that was just the ethernet cable. You have to have a camera. You have to have microphones that actually work. And it, again, this is this all comes down to your venues. A lot of them are set up. The big conferences tend to be sort of conference centers or hotels or universities. And those are basically a bunch of rooms that they just have rooms, but they're not actually set up for conference calling. So like, I mean, we struggle to record people in a room uh, with recording equipment because you either have to mic up everyone with like lapel mics or you set out a central microphone and then as people walk away you get that sort of like you could tell as they're walking around because like they get closer and further away from the microphone it's really hard to hear i'd actually say like the surprisingly the hardest thing about streaming is not the video aspect it is actually the sound aspect um, and of course now you can get really fancy sound equipment that can do conference calling where you could basically it's algorithms it figures out people's place in the room and it adjusts the volume does all this crazy stuff they're really cool super expensive so you have to have a venue that has that already built in and most of them just don't they just there's no capacity to actually do a hybrid event that is fairly decent for people and you know lots of people have done it where like they've set up like I don't know, laptop or tablet or something like that and just streamed like their session from a conference. And it somewhat works, but again, the quality is highly variable and that runs into a huge problem. So like most of us are okay to sort of be like, okay, it's a crappy stream, but I didn't pay for the conference. So why am I going to complain about someone who's done like a periscope on twitter or something like that and you know okay so i occasionally miss some words that's that's it but like if you're going to charge people for access which you didn't have to do because you have to make back the i don't know thousand dollars two thousand dollars per room session that you're paying in equipment from your venue then you have to sort of you have to make it good. I guess you could try to make it cheap, but then, you know, a bunch of tablets, you overwhelm the Wi-Fi, and then you're like, okay, well, maybe we just move over to a bunch of phones and do hotspots that way. And, you know, depending on the building, how old it is, infrastructure, that may or may not work. It's it's a complete mess. So from a right. technical standpoint, <laughs> it is actually – super like it's super easy to do a really crappy stream one off for a session at a conference that everyone's seen but to do it at scale yeah. man guys it's it's like a whole other level and the cost is it's gonna like i okay i i sh right 
I was about to exaggerate and say double, but it, it, it legitimately could double your cost of your conference, your in-person conference. Um, it really depends yeah. on the venue and what they're willing to do and you know how much actually they're going to charge you to be able to do streaming. Right. I, I really appreciate that backstory there, Doug. I think nobody you know thinks about that, the bottlenecks that they that are there for a live stream. So I think in terms of... Um, Going forward conferences, I think they'll have to split it into thirds. And what I mean by that, it's already split into half in terms of presentations and posters. I think it's going to be presentations, posters and online where they have sort of a makeshift studio set up, you know, where only a portion of the conference is online at any given time, because I just don't think there's any way to have every conference, you know, every Mm -hmm. presenter streamed live. And like you said, do you really want to watch that? <laughs> well, yeah, actually, because we want to watch each other anyway. So I have a feeling that people will actually watch that. Um, I, I think quality. that's. So bad. You know, the quality, serious, you know, quality like in, of our work already of- is kind of. You, you, we just read it off of Microsoft you know, piece of paper, right? It's not like it's Ted talks here. Not me, man. I'm a show. <laughs> yeah, but like the, there's a difference between like, uh, yeah, one if you do stream it, you are going to reach a lot more people, but it, it really is that quality. It's, it's tough. Like it, it's a difference between of like boring, uh, a boring presentation is still much more bearable than the presentation where you're like, word, this T O T O Kwan. like if it's breaking up and you're like getting like every third, fourth, whatever, it, it, it's it's tough and then like again you yeah. like that's it's a weird thing where like yeah you can you can shoestring it um and you could possibly get by but when you're shoestringing you really can't charge it, i don't know you can't really do large conferences at at scale with that so like okay so a, a small conference maybe a single room i don't know if you guys can fill me in I'm assuming the California Archaeology Society conference, maybe a couple hundred people, maybe yeah, one room. Of, guess. Yeah, one yeah. room of presentations. Does it have like maybe two rooms? That is comp- probably two. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That is that is completely is, doable. Yeah. But like the economics of when you suddenly, so like I, I've I've hosted conferences before, and essentially you can do a conference quite cheaply quite well for maybe a hundred people, maybe 200 people, you know, two or three rooms and you're at venues like, yeah, now you can easily find a church somewhere or a community center or someplace like that where the rental of, of the building or the place is it's minimal couple hundred easy to get catering if you're doing catering and you can stream because you you know you're doing like maybe two or three streams uh you you run into issues but it's it's not that bad but so i've i've mainly looked at the uk but like the best i could find so in edinburgh the best i could do is we can probably go about 175 people and do a quality conference for a minimum price, you know, like 30 pounds for like two days or something like that, which is, which is, and feed people. It's, it's, you know, we can do it, get a little sponsorship. It's quite easy. But if we were ever to try to host a conference over about 175, 200 people, the costs go through the roof because essentially you can no longer do a lot of like community centers and churches and stuff like that. And suddenly you're looking at either hotels or you know professional conferencing places such as you know conferencing centers but there's you know the big ones like each city has like a conference whatever center but then you know, sometimes there'll be some other ones and stuff like that and the prices on that are just it's incredible like like you jump there's there's no in between where you sort of gradually go up it, it's like really affordable and easy you're paying per person 100 200 and that's it that's like that's you're paying that there's nothing there's no way to get around it there's no way to cut costs that's what it is at so like those big conferences are pretty much kind of screwed because they have no way to do anything well i think we should talk more about this on the uh after this break i mean we brought up a lot of really good comments but price it seems to me like that 
that's the main sticking point. But uh, we'll end this segment here and we'll come back after the break. Chris Webster here for the Archaeology Podcast Network. We strive for high quality interviews and content so you can find information on any topic in archaeology from around the world. One way we do that is by recording interviews with our hosts and guests located in many parts of the world all at once. We do that through the use of Zencaster. That's Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R. Zencaster allows us to record high quality audio with no stress on the guest. Just send them a link to click on and that's it. Zencaster does the rest. They even do automatic transcriptions. Check out the link in the show notes for 30% off your first three months or go to Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R dot com and use the code CRMARC. Looking to expand your knowledge of x-rays and imaging in the archaeology field? Then check out An Introduction to Paleo Radiography, a short online course offering professional training for archaeologists and affiliated disciplines. Created by archaeologist, radiographer, and lecturer James Elliott, the content of this course is based upon his research and teaching experience in higher education. It is approved by the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists as four hours of training. That's in the UK, for those of you that don't know. So don't miss out on this exciting opportunity for professional and personal development. For more information on pricing, and course structure, visit paleoimaging.com. That's P-A-L-E-O imaging.com. And look for the link in the show notes to this episode. Okay, welcome back to the second segment of episode 230 of the CRM Archaeology Podcast. And we've been talking about, I mean, what it would mean for archaeology conferences to go virtual or hybrid. But at the end of the last segment, Doug brought up some excellent uh, comments about costs. And I think yeah. Heather has something to say about that. Yeah, I, I, I thought, you know, it's, it's funny. We just had a conversation at work where we do crossover. We attend different conferences. And by the way, my throat for the listeners is a result of flying across the country. <laughs> it just goes to show you. And it just came on me this morning. And, you know, so just like you can it, it definitely understand why people are concerned, right? Because you don't know, you can go on the plane, you think you're fine. And I don't think I contracted anything on the plane. I think it was where I was at. And then it just happened to surface as, as I landed. And now, you know, I'm thinking, was I irresponsible flying and, and exposing people unknowingly, right? But anyway, I wore my mask and everything. But anyway, so I apologize for my, for my voice. But, you know, we were just having this this talk, you know, we had all of our group leaders kind of chit chatting. And in our company, the way it's set up is the practice manager is not an archaeologist. They are a compliance analyst or a CEQA analyst, CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act, or those outside of California. And he is used to conferences costing like $900 to $1,000 to attend. And so we were talking about how we'd like to have more people attending. We didn't want to just have people who are speaking attending. We want to have some of our staff that are newer be able to take in the environment, go to the conference if they want to, and to, whether it's virtual or in person, and, and to really soak it up and, and kind of get their feet wet. Some of them may or may not have attended conferences when they were in school. And as professionals, we want them to kind of just get their feet wet without having to have this pressure of presenting and having them in supportive roles. And so he was like a little apprehensive because he was thinking about the cost. And when we told him how much it was, it was like kind of boggled his mind. He's like, ah, just invite everyone. Everyone could go, right? And so I think, you know, that when it comes to archaeology conferences, there's definitely this, you know, what, what Doug is saying as far as, you know, cost and people wanting to get their money's worth and, you know, being able to give quality for the amount of money that they pay. I think that that is, is probably, I, I guess everything's relative, right? So for the archaeologists, it's cheaper because archaeologists don't make all that much, right? But I do think that overall, this whole COVID thing is definitely going to be impacting conferences, it has to. It's going to completely overhaul. I mean, people have to think about this. People, whether people think it's valid or not, people are going to be very concerned about going to conferences on a regular basis. I think this is something, this COVID is, is really going to revamp how we get together because there's so many different aspects of, 
of of conferences. It's not just about giving talks. I mean, how many talks do you have where you walk into the room and there's literally three people listening, right? Yeah. I actually, I like the idea that and, what Andrew is saying is that, you know, have it, have it in, you know, different aspects of the conference. So if you want to have, and we talked about this in our last episode, 3209 or whatever, mm -hmm. 207. And that was having a comp, uh, the conference where you're just kind of purchasing the the top end of the conferences, the ones that everybody wants to attend. And you can kind of, you could figure that out. Everybody knows who's going to, who, which con which talks are going to be the most um, watched. So right. you could also do a survey before a conference and figure out, or you could just set it up where people are signing up for certain, for certain talks ahead of time. And then you stream only those. Yeah, then, I totally, yeah, I totally agree, Heather. I think I think they're going to at least have to like tier the cost, you know, where it's like, are you on ground? Are you only online? You know, like a rock concert, you know, it's like you got, yeah. you're you got different experiences, you know, do you get a VIP pass or not? Right. Mm -hmm. So and, and I, I think that's something they need to be creative about. I think they're kind of behind the ball on that, you know, but I, I think the circumstances will force it, which is ultimately a good thing if they if it's. Done I well. Agree. well, I mean, I'm not I don't know if it'll necessarily be a good thing as much as it's going to end up being a thing, because I was just looking right now. But my wife does human resources in one of her professional organizations to go to their annual conference. It's uh, if you're a non member. Uh, and you want to go in person, it's, you know, 1100 or it's yeah. uh, $2,200. If you sign up on site, it's 2500 But if you decide to go virtual and you're a non-member, it's $1,600 or $1,500. So it's like $1,000 mm -hmm. less. And right. then, you know, if you are a member, it's uh, about $1,000 less there. So like, that's, you know, exactly what you all are talking about. If you're a member, it's one price. If you wait until the last minute, it's another price. If you're, you know, on site, if you're alumni, yeah, those tiered paying systems. I mean, I, that's, that's what others are doing. And you can tell they're, you know, five times more than archaeology conference. Mm -hmm. I think but Doug has something to say. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was, I was going to say Heather was spot on. Um, and that brings up a, you know, that, and what everyone else has been mentioning, uh, Bill, about like it's, you know, other conferences, you know, it's a thousand dollars or fifteen hundred or so, so much like that. Um, but that that's sort of makes it also more difficult for archaeology, big archaeology organizations, because like Marriott, they'll be able to rebook that time. They don't really care that archaeologists don't make a lot of money. And so like. In any one city at a large conference, there there's maybe only two a handful of venues and like small cities. So like when SAA was in Albuquerque and it was at the conference center there, that was pretty much the only venue that could have held that many archaeologists. Uh, I guess technically you could have done it at like UNM or one of the universities if they were willing to do that, but most of them aren't. And you know it's usually during term time, term time and stuff like that. But like, that's the thing and they have it. So it's super expensive. And I think a lot of organizations, the problem with offering an a online is they're, it's so new to people. They don't know how to correctly price and correctly estimate. So right. like a lot of, there's a lot of fear that like, if you do a hybrid, suddenly more people are going to just not show up. And then, it, you know, it's, it's really tough. Like there's a lot of fear I think is going on with a lot of organizations of the unknown. And also, you know, it depends on the organization. Some, you know, organizations make their money off of journals and membership subscriptions, which is mainly driven by the journal or they make it off conferences. So I think there's a lot of fear out there. I don't necessarily think it may turn out as bad as they think it will. Yay. Yeah. Basically, is only a. I mean, there is a journal with it, but for that conference, uh, European Archaeology Association, it's a, it's basically a conference-based organization at the moment. They did theirs all digital the first year of COVID, and it was for free. Uh, they they lost money, but they had money in reserves, and surprisingly, their membership didn't really go down. And then the next year, they did it uh, again. It was meant to be in person or a hybrid, and they had to go all digital. And again, membership held up quite well. If right. if anything, 
um, it, it, it's always been a, a bit tough because like their membership is almost entirely decided by like how many people attend the conference and digital actually did okay. Um, but I think there's a lot of fear with a lot of people that, you know, whoa, if we do a hybrid, maybe we lose half the people that show up right. um, and then depending on the venue, some venues, you know, it's per conference attendee, some it's a flat fee. So suddenly if you've booked 20 rooms or 40 rooms and you're using 10, that's, that's a, a pretty big loss. Uh, so I think, I think most of it, a lot of, there's a lot of fear out there and a lot of lack of expertise in this area. That's really going to hurt a lot of conferences. But um, you know, I, I see several years of us going through this sort of ooh, up and down of hi, tr people trying to figure out hybrid. how to do digital, yeah. how to do hybrid. Of course. I, I think we're like f at least five more years of this sort of, I agree. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't want to call it a mess, but um, I don't know. Wherever you guys, whatever term you listener want to describe this, lots of people canceling, uh, it being all over the place, uh, some conferences not offering a hybrid or, uh, you know, this this whole mess that's happening at the moment. Yeah, I think we have a couple more years of this. But you know what? I, I think I think they need to conquer their fear, and I do think it's a blessing in disguise because if we think broad about conferences in general, some of it is kind of dinosaur like. Like, do yeah. I really need to go to the AAAs anymore? No, I don't. Do I really need to go to the SAAs anymore? No, I don't. I've, I've found that, and I'm honest, you know, I've found that local conferences, much more bang for the buck. So I, I really like the California yeah. conferences, and I like the ones that are focused in Belize specifically for my Maya stuff. But the big conferences, yeah. why should I go there? I have to pay a ton of money for nothing. You know why? Like, I think that this is this is something that people aren't talking about, or or maybe they are, and I'm just clueless. But conferences are an excuse to have your company pay for you to go somewhere <laughs> it's a paid vacation that's not a vacation <laughs> okay you get to go somewhere else you get to go to philadelphia you're gonna go i mean they, they pick venues that are fun to go to right you go to they always do. drink you know how many people go to these they actually don't go to any of the talks or they go to a very few of the dogs i mean you hear this all the time where people that show up at the conference they give their talk but then they don't even go to 90% of the presentations, yeah. you know, so it's just an excuse to go out and have the company pay for a week of working, which is really a, a vacation because right. nobody anymore expects anybody to double up on hotel rooms, right? Yeah. So you have your own hotel room, which then what do you get to do? Bring your family with you. Yeah. Right? I, think that's, and, yeah I think it's a great point. And the only thing you really get in those are connections, you know, like interpersonal yes. connections, like those right. are important and, so, th and those are the only real things, but the presentations to watch the presentation itself, people don't do you know, it. yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it's diminishing returns. I mean, yeah. I don't know what to say about any of that stuff. I always go to as many of the talks as I can. The connections, nerd. I mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, you're right. We're all nerds, but I guess maybe I'm the one who I'm the nerdiest of the nerd, I guess. That I, 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 go, I go to them too. Um, Bill, I totally agree, but there are a lot of people who don't, yeah. especially people yeah. that are going there on their company's dime. Yeah. So, I, I, I mean, I can definitely, yeah. I hear all of that stuff too, man. I, and, you know, I don't know. That's, so I guess if we switch it to this different tiered model, we're going to be left with the people who actually want to go to all the stuff. True. That, that could be a good thing. I mean, the one thing that I'm kind of concerned about is like accessibility because when I was, you know, a crew chief or whatever, my company's, let me think, I'm pretty sure they paid for like the plane ticket and then they might give me money if I gave a presentation for about a company project. Yeah. I got paid for that day and then I had to use vacation time for all the rest. And I paid for my own hotel room. So I did bunk with other people in my company. Or I guess I was just selfish and paid for it myself, right? Depending on how much money I could afford. So I wasn't always getting paid for all that stuff. But I was still going to it because I actually liked seeing the presentations. And I also liked, you know, networking and connecting with other people. And, you know, you if you're a nerd like me, you go to you know, Albuquerque, and then you see nothing because you spent all your time at the the conference, right? So you never got to see anything outside of that little area. But I'm, I'm kind of concerned about like, how are we, like, I would imagine that having the hybrid thing personally would 
allow more people to sign up and be able to watch it. For example, right. you know, people who are students in other countries where they can't afford to come to the United States can have their anthro department pay for, you know, a virtual membership. And then they can all show up to a room and they can all tune in and watch the talks or they can be part of the discussions that they otherwise wouldn't have come all the way to Albuquerque or Philadelphia or, you know, San Francisco. Right. So, like, I, I would think that that would make this more accessible. And, and I think that, you know, if we do what Andrew's talking about, we have the potential f- to reach even bigger audiences. And if they're paying the the virtual price for the conference, then, uh, you know, right. Wouldn't you think that if you pitch it correctly, you would actually increase the number of people who go to the conference? Yes. That yes. is exactly what happened for us uh, locally for the Ventura County Archaeological Society. When we had to go online forced to by COVID, we got way more membership and we got like 150 people at one of the talks, one of the Zoom talks. We have never had that number of people on ground. The the comment that Andrew made about regional specific conferences, I think, you know, as, a, as an archaeologist, we are regional, right? And I do think that if conferences are meant to serve as continuing education, that the regional aspect is important. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's that the other side of that is that, oh, you should go to these conferences to hear like the broad swath of what's going on, you know, throughout you know North America or this kind of thing. But it's this odd in between, because when you break out of your little groups at California Archaeologists and you go see what's happening in Wyoming, everyone's like, why'd you go to the Wyoming one? Why don't you stay in the California one? You know, so it's a, it's a funny balance. Uh, at, at these conferences. And again, I, I sort of, you know, right back to Heather's point, I totally agree with the regional thing. Just in my experience, I've gotten much more bang for the buck. Yeah. Well, just to sort of talk about, again, the sort of difficulties of bigger ones, because they've, they've booked out venue. The problem with like the big conferences is they've booked out venues for the last, for the next three or four or five years. And so there's, they have a, a real problem with legacy where a small conference, you know, it depends on who's organizing it, but they may not book the venue until like six months before or three or or whatnot. So it's really easy for them to innovate. And I think you're going to see a lot more innovation. And to be honest, I think I've seen a lot more innovation by the smaller conferences over the last two years. Oh, okay. We're not quite at two years of COVID, but pretty much... I'm just thinking of like, so I, I help out with a local one, TAFAC, which is Tayside and Perth Conference. And the last two conferences have been, e- even even though they didn't have to because the restrictions on the last one have been digital. And they've actually, they basically said it's free and open to anyone. And we, if you want, could you please give a donation? And donations have actually covered all the costs associated with that. And that was, we like pre-filmed all the talks. So if the tech failed the day of, we could just send people to a um, YouTube video and be like, all right, here's the talk. Um, we're sorry about Q and A is not going to happen at the moment, but whatever. So we've, we've had backups and that covered time and everything. Uh, I think a lot of smaller conferences and regional ones will be a lot more nimble because they don't have this legacy of having booked venues and put down deposits for the last, I don't know, is, is not, isn't SAA like booked out for like five years or something like that, or three, something crazy. I know EAA's at least booked out three or four years in advance on venues. And I think AAAs are similar. Like I think all the big ones are going to be in a real, real trouble because they've probably mm-hmm. all booked and put deposits down for the next like half decade yeah and they haven't and there's there's just there's driven by fear because they don't quite know how to do a hybrid event and there were organizations not archaeology but especially in computing and software where they actually sell conferences as being in person and then sold a not live streamed but a recorded version later that people could go to and it affected, you know, it didn't affect their numbers at all. So I think it is quite possible. I just think you probably have a lot of conference organizers slash organization societies that are a bit freaked Mm. out because they have put down tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, in booking fees and made plans for the next, I don't know, 
at least a couple of years, maybe a half decade, maybe a decade. I don't know. And they're probably all freaking out about that. Yeah, I can, I can, I don't know about the, you know, down payments or everything for every organization, but I can definitely say that the freak out is real and not just among, you know, archaeology. It's, you know, me at my house and worrying about my family and everything. But yeah, I, legacy, panic, this all being new, even though it's not really new, right? Because we're archaeologists. We know that this isn't the first time there's been a pandemic or a plague or even like, massive climate change that causes the reordering of entire society. It's like, we're all, we're all hanging out and looking at the news without realizing that this is something that happens to people. And we happen to be at alive at a time when it is happening. But I, I mean, we're going to stop right now, but maybe, and I hope we don't start with panic on the next segment, but we ended this one with panic and we'll start the other one, the next segment on something else. See you after this, uh, after this break. <laughs> You may have heard my pitch for membership. It's a great idea and really helps out. However, you can also support us by picking up a fun t-shirt, sticker, or something from a large selection of items from our T Public store. Head over to arcpodnet.com slash shop for a link. That's arcpodnet.com slash shop to pick up some fun swag and support the show. All right, we're in the final segment of CRM Archaeology Podcast, episode 230. We're talking about how um, the pandemic is changing, you know, everything. We've spent quite a bit of time talking about conferences. And uh, once again, Heather's got something to add to the conversation to lead us off. (laughs) Well, I was just, you know, Doug had made an interesting point just at the end of the last segment talking about how some conferences had, you know, they they had the in-person and then later on they offered a a uh, recorded version of it and it was rather successful and i think that definitely did happen i've 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 heard of you know multiple conferences doing really well on the on the back end selling their certain talks but i think some of that is because people were able you know word got out that there was a really good talk that happened that they want to you know you, you probably want to you know listen to this guy or 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 some you know a lot of times we don't even know you know, people have not published yet. So we don't know exactly what their findings are. And so it comes out in a conference and and that kind of starts catching some momentum and then people buy, you know, uh, I, I could see why people would want to buy the conferences later on down the road because it's a known entity, because it was it was successful. It was a it was something they'd want to listen to. And I I do definitely think that we have gotten uh, just like I think it was Andrew was saying, we're in kind of like this dinosaur age. We have stuck with the same thing. Uh, it's the same thing that Chris talks and gripes about all the time about people not wanting to go to digital. Archaeologists are stuck in this. We have to go to a conference. That's where we connect. That's where we kind of present our new findings. And, you know, if it isn't for uh, or at least how we introduce our publications or whatever. Um and I think that we do definitely need to find some solutions to how we're going to have continuing education. I mean, that's what conferences should be. Conferences should be continuing education. It should be that people are learning something, not that they're just, it's an excuse to have a drink fest. I, I think that we really need to be conscious and, and have a good conversation about what conferences are, what they should be, what we want them to be in the future, and how honestly we've gotten stuck uh, in where we're at right now. And then use this, this unfortunate incident or this unfortunately unfortunate circumstance with COVID as an impetus to totally evolving and, and revamping our continuing education. Because I don't think it should just be looked at as a conference. I think that we need to look at this as how as professionals do we continue to educate ourselves and each other? Yeah, and I, I agree. I think yeah. they totally have to think those big thoughts, you know, and, and make the choices to make it different. It's not just me go to conference because I go to conference. Me need extra line in my CV. You know, it's like, right. let's well, have some real you know, good choices here. I mean, I agree. We've got, we've got a few minutes to talk about that. Right. Because th- here's my thing that, that, you know, I, I'm, I'm hung up on. I don't remember what it was like to go through a pandemic or to have everything reshuffled, right? Like I I wasn't alive during the world wars and I wasn't alive during the end of the ice age and and into the archaic, right? So I actually have no frame of reference for how to change things. And I guess I would ask you all like, 
What have you seen that is something that you think that archaeologists could do that can bring us forward into the future? Because I have pretty much gone to 50 something archaeology conferences and I know how they are. And so I don't I, what I don't know is how they could possibly be better. I've never been to anything else that was better or different. I think the answer is outside of conferences. I don't think conferences should be gone away with altogether. But I think that we should be looking at other options. And I'm blanking on we just talked about it in the last podcast. What Chris was has started would was starting black something. What's the name of it? Oh, Team Black. Yeah, just Team the black. trainings and connections. Right. Yeah, where where we're you know looking at continuing education in segments, and we're really looking at what what do people want to learn? Not only what do they want to learn, but what should they learn? What's going to make that? What's going to it broaden their skill set? And this isn't just about you know the conferences are still stuck on. New findings are still, which is good. We still, you know, we're scientists. We need to do that. But there's no, I know there are some, but they're not all that popular. There's nothing specific for CRM. And that gives this, you know, this incentive for people to continually uh, increase their education. So CRM professionals are going to academic conferences, which I think is good because it mixes it up and we need to be together. But at the same time, because they're set up as academic conferences, they're not set up as professional conferences, it's it's not as good as it could be. I do yeah. see some changes with workshops. We have some changes right. with workshops. But it's still it's not enough. Yeah, I do think those workshops are cool though. And and at the smaller conferences, again, there is more of a CRM presence, you know, like something like the California Archaeology Conference, there is a real like palpable CRM aspect to that, where if you go to the AAAs, there's not, you know, which is which is nice. But what, what I would say in terms of making things for the better, I think we joked earlier about the TED Talk thing, but I think you could basically do TED Talks where it's like, okay, at the conference, you have a studio set up and people who are prepped do a very interesting 15 minute talk where they have to talk off the cuff to the camera as if they were giving a real presentation to an audience and they could be more dynamic and interesting than the real one. So you could actually make the taped ones more exciting. I agree. I, th- I think we might actually be going, and this is doable digital, like real old school, like back to like the Republic of Letters time. Like, I mean, if you're thinking like journals, the original journals were not this highly peer reviewed, all about status sort of thing. I mean, if you read the really old stuff, it's it's basically people writing letters to each other being like, yeah, so uh, an apple hit my head today. I think there might be this thing called gravity. Um, but it's stuff like that. And, where, and then you get like the salons and stuff like that where people just essentially gathered. I imagine you could probably do that fairly well on Zoom and Teams where you basically just have smaller groups. I know some people already do that, but yeah. I, I think it would be more interesting if in a way we start moving away from conferences being highly stylized, highly tied into, I mean, you guys have touched on the different points where conferences are designed for academic use. And mm-hmm. that's, that's mainly about putting stuff on your CV uh, some of it is the networks and, you know, meeting up with people and stuff like that. But it'd be really interesting if we started to move away from that, start to move away from highly stylized publications as a way of, you know, communicating. And that's the final word. Uh, right. I think you could end right. up with some much more informal, but more processed stuff. So in a sense of it's not a workshop, it's a series of workshops where, you get together with people and work through certain problems. Yeah. Which I think would be much more valuable if say like once a month you had a zoom meeting with, I don't know, pick your guys's topic, maybe GIS or I don't know, pottery or something like that. And Mm. you, it was a process of time where you're working through different problems and people have input as opposed to, 
And I already did this. Um, thank yeah. you for your input, but I can't change the project I've already done. Um, it's already been bulldozed. Uh, I really wish you'd have done that comment before uh, six months ago. But uh, yeah, we'll take it on board. Yeah, the only problem with that is the power dynamics, though, in archaeology, right? So you'd have to have some community guidelines where you're supposed to pass the ball of yarn from the people in the circle or something like that and give people a chance to talk without being interrupted. Because I can absolutely see some of the old silverbacks or whatever in archaeology just going hog wild in those places where they're not given any kind of time limit to shut the hell up and they just keep going on and on and on and then they badger people who have other good ideas into the ground to the point where people who are conflict diverse they don't even show up to those things right so yeah, to, me, can, to me those salons to the water yeah, you can blow yeah, out of the with the TED Talk thing. Like you do your own, it's 15 minutes, you're dynamic, you're interesting, and nobody gives a damn what the old dinosaurs say. Yeah, yeah well, you know, the uh, TED Talk thing could, could show could up. be a thing, but, you know, those salons would just be like, you know, ancient archaeos just, you know, out of control, ha- talking on and on forever. I mean, it would be a lot like a faculty meeting, basically. Yeah, I don't I don't know, it could be deadly. I don't, I don't think they'd actually show up. I don't think those sort of people, because those people no, those are very people, much – in the system of they care about like they don't care about what they've produced they care about how they produced it when they produced it um so they they want to be a blowhard yeah um where where it matters and like so like because i mean there's i've i don't know a lot of universities will have like postgraduate like workshop not quite workshops but maybe like seminars and stuff like that and they always have real trouble getting the faculty to show up because the faculty don't want to spend their time with a bunch of grad students who are actually you know doing a lot of work and stuff i would suspect that i i agree with the bill you probably definitely need to have strong uh community guidelines yeah. and people trained in facilitation but i suspect a lot of those people would just never even show up yeah well you might be surprised right the minute we say something about their theory they've hung their 50 right. years of whatever on and we change those you know ceramic you know chronologies they created in quotation marks they'll be showing up to those salons yeah i would really like to see something more interactive and having i mean you have debates i'm not saying we have to turn this into a debate you know, whatever. But uh, I think maybe a little bit of healthy debate would be good because you, what it is right now is just passive aggressive. Um, I'm going to, you know, everybody has to be quiet because I'm giving a presentation. I'm reading from my paper, and and then there's no no responsibility for any feedback later on. And I think that that would definitely, I think that would capture also the younger uh, set uh, where interaction is important. Um, you know, I, I think that um, I definitely think that including other people when it comes to CRM or actually even, you know, even in um, academic conferences, but I'll, I'll focus on CRM, bringing in agencies, bringing in agency uh, employees, bringing in people that um, actually are the, the consumers of the product for CRM, making it, uh, you know, much more interactive with all the entities and take in, you know, what it is that we do produce and uh, making sure that, you know, everybody that goes to the conference is learning how they can communicate things in a uh, more palatable way for, for people outside of archaeology. All those kind of different aspects, I think, are, are what grow you as a professional. And to me, that's what conferences should be. If it's continuing education, it should be about everybody leads the conference a better archaeologist. Everybody leaves the conference a better professional. And I think that seems oversimplified, but why else are we going to conferences? Are we just going to conferences to be blowhards, like you guys are saying? You know, are they just, everybody's going there so they can preen as peacocks? Or are we really going because we want to improve, because we want to learn? That's what it should be. No, I think Heather, I think you're totally right. You know, and it, and yes, you, you, we could like make fun and be like, oh, that's so naive, but it's true, right? Underneath it all, that's what it's supposed to be. And a cool place to vacation as well, <laughs> like Albuquerque, right? <laughs> hey man, go visit family. Go visit family, dude. Um, I, I was going to say, I went to St. Charles, Missouri. That's how much I love archaeology. Yeah, actually, think, it, wasn't, it wasn't St. Charles. I'll have to look up and see where it actually was, but it, it didn't even actually have Cahokia there. But I had a, we got snowed in and I still learned a lot and it was a good conference and great time. I think one of the things 
I think digital will be part of conferences in the future, hopefully. But I also think it's going to fundamentally change how archaeologists consider ethics as well. Because uh, right now, at a lot of conferences, essentially all the stuff that like people are, you know, yell at people on social media, like, do not just display human remains. Um, and then, you know, like site locations, stuff like that, or uh, depending, I mean, there's definitely much, these issues are much more in North America, but, you know, also like religious imagery, all that sort of stuff. Like, is I am so amazed at conferences where people will, like, a week before on, on Twitter, we've been like yelling at some member of the public because they happen to show like a skeleton. They'll be like, you're a horrible, horrible human being. And then like at that conference, there'll be like 40 slides of human remains. And somehow like, that's okay. Like it's okay if we show like a hundred archeologists, but God forbid, like five members of the public see this confidential information. I think if you start doing stuff digital where we should be thinking about this anyways, because you know, archaeology conference, you actually don't know who's in the audience. But with digital, it's much more explicit. And I think people will start thinking about ethics and, you know, maybe not putting all their site locations on maps at the intro of their slides. Because, you know, just because you present it at an archaeology conference doesn't mean you've made that secure information. I think, I hope that, like, when things start to go online, those ethical concerns on a whole range of different subjects get pushed more to the forefront and people are less blasé about, oh, it doesn't matter. It's only archaeologists seeing it because you can't actually guarantee it's only archaeologists seeing it and you can't guarantee the archaeologists seeing it are going to be ethical or good people. Yeah. I mean, I think this is great for us to talk about the future of what our get together should look like, but I think we should actually have them more often, right? So if we go online, we will be able to have them Every month, every two or three months, right? We can always have regional get togethers as part of your membership for the society, right? So for the, some of the larger ones like the SAA, we live across the country. So we could have California folks getting together every three months without a conference to just talk and have those conversations that you're talking about and, you know, enjoy ourselves and go to a great part of our state or, you know, we'd, we could even have it like at the park or at one of the university uh, meeting rooms or something like that to try and minimize the cost. So that it's just part of your membership. This is just what you get. One of the things as being a member, you can just come on a weekend that the organization has those folks in that area have kind of put it together and you know, you're a member and, and we just talk and it doesn't have to be formal presentations. Just like you're saying, you know, we can have these projects that are problems in our state and what would CRM and agency folks together with uh, folks at universities, what, what will we do to brainstorm? How can we approach this thing? Or, you know, what's one of the concerns? And if we have them more often, then it doesn't end up being this, you know, all all encompassing annual meeting where you have to binge drink, where you have to make all the interviews, where you have to have the job talks and like every single thing. It doesn't have to be this massive, you know, extravaganza. If you've gone to a couple of them during the year, then maybe you don't have the same pressure to go all the way to, I keep, we keep bagging on Albuquerque. I'll say my homeland to go all the way to Boise, Idaho, right. To, to see the presentation. Maybe you don't got to go to Boise because you already went to the one in your part of Oregon or whatever. Like, I think that, that that would be another one, especially if we're kind of recording some of this stuff down, if some of this stuff is being recorded and, and it is just a room with maybe 30 or 40 people who got together in the, the mid-year meeting or something like that, then, you know, we kind of have a document. This stuff can live on and we can practice all those ethics and we can try to provide space for people to become better, but we can get to know each other better because we're meeting more often. Yeah, Bill, I think that's a great idea. And I know that those larger entities like the SAA, they have those little breakout interest groups, you know, so they could just like rev those up a little more like the rock art interest group. You know, there's there's multiple there's dozens of those mm -hmm. or the Southwest, you know, folks live in the Southwest. Mm hmm. Where are we going to meet? We're going to meet in Lake Havasu and Chris's uh, fifth wheel. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think, uh, I think these conferences, a lot of times they don't allow for all voices to be heard. Because people get very intimidated by conferences. They think I have to have some earth shattering discovery in order to actually present somewhere. Right. And, and I, I do think that, you know, suggestions that you, that you're making bill, I think would, would definitely, you know, we do have the SCAs have society of California archeology span has uh, the data sharing meetings. Right. So that that's one aspect. I think of that, I think being able to just have these, like we said, informal conversations in a conference setting where 
you know, all voices are being heard so that, you know, just because you haven't published something or because you haven't discovered something major, um, that you, you still may have something very valuable to, to the group. And so, you know, that kind of allows for another segment. There's a lot of people that are not doing work that is easily presentable in a conference. Yeah, I just want to shout out for the data sharing yeah. meetings. I totally agree. The data sharing meetings are some of my favorites. Yeah. Well, it sounds to me like we've come to the agreement that we're all going to start meeting together, you know, more frequently and, and maybe uh, replicating some of the best practices of organizations that are already doing this kind of stuff. But, you know, folks, we've got hopefully hundreds of folks who are going to listen to this episode. If you've seen anything awesome out there, you know, uh, tell us about it, right? Because we can always reach out to our archaeology organizations and try those experiments out. If there's one thing that I think that, you know, COVID is showing us is that everything that we knew, <laughs> we didn't actually, yeah. in fact, know, right? And so now we're moving forward without any kind of map or guide. And uh, we can look at what previous generations have gone through as, you know, give us a, a, a general idea. But in general, like all the stuff that we have is changing. So uh, the conferences are, are actually no different. Okay, I guess I probably should end out. Let me go to the notes, right? What does he say here? Ooh, Goodbye. He doesn't, he doesn't have a script. <laughs> <laughs> you got to so move faster, Bill. You got to move faster. <laughs> all right. After all this conversation about COVID and everything, I appreciate everyone listening to this episode. And uh, as Chris always says, thanks to everyone listening. And he'll see you in the field. I'll see you at the conference, I hope, in the future. Uh, take care, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye. See you next time. Goodbye. <laughs> That's it for another episode of the CRM Archaeology Podcast. Links to some of the items mentioned on the show are in the show notes for this podcast, which can be found at www.archpodnet.com slash podcast. Please comment and share anywhere you see the show. If you'd like us to answer a question on a future episode, email us. Use the contact form on the website or just email chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Support the show and the network at archpodnet.com slash members. Get some swag and extra content while you're there. Send us show suggestions and interview suggestions. We want this to be a resource for field technicians everywhere, and we want to know what you want to know about. Thanks to everyone for joining me this week. Thanks also to the listeners for tuning in, and we'll see you in the field. Goodbye. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, DigTech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info.